Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, some work I've been doing for the last couple of years, uh, which, uh, as you'll see, started around non-volatile memory, but has become a little bit more general since then. Uh, but before I get into it, a few words from our lawyers. Uh, the usual stuff about uh, if you watch this talk and you're thinking of doing any kind of legal transaction with Oracle, you need to read this slide first. Okay, um, so the general overview of the talk is um, I'm going to talk about automatic persistence, to give a little bit of background and history there, uh, the motivation for the work, some of the history that took place um, now several decades ago, and uh, some of the lessons that at least I have learned, I'm not sure these are widely uh, agreed upon lessons, but I will um, describe what I have inferred from that experience. And then talk about the new uh, many heap model of persistence that I've been working on, which tries to address some of these issues and um, how it looks in when embodied in Java and uh, some of the issues that uh, come up in the implementation, uh, given that this is a VM conference. So um, not, not a lot of um, programmers seem to appreciate that non-volatile RAM is already here. Uh, you can go out and buy a system, um, an Intel server-based machine, and some uh, memory modules under their brand name Optane, which gives you non-volatile memory. Um, there's a lot potentially to say about this technology, but I'm gonna keep it very, very brief in the interest of time. Um, if you want more detail, uh, follow the link on the bottom right of this slide uh, to my blog post, which will take you to even more deeper analyses of the technology if you if you want more information. But the, the short, um, thumbnail sketch is that this memory is significantly denser inherently because of the technology than DRAM. So you can put a lot more memory inside a box than you can with DRAM. Uh, it's a little bit slower um, for reads, a reasonable amount slower for writes about the same bandwidth is a little bit less. Um, it can be cheaper. Um, RAM, DRAM prices have been all over the map this last year, so it depends on exactly what you compare with and when. But it's probably not going to be more expensive per bit than, than DRAM. But the most important property from the point of view of this presentation is that it's non-volatile, which means that when you take the power off, whatever was saved in one of those modules will still be there when you put the power back on again. And this has can have at least some fairly... Uh, serious implications on the way we build systems. So um, when it comes to programming and using this memory, um, the non-volatile RAM in one of these systems is organized as a file system. So those of you who are uh, as old as I am will remember RAM disks. Basically, you have something that looks like a RAM disk, except that it doesn't lose its state when you turn the power off. Um, so you have individual files and they can be mapped into a processes address space. And then once a, a file has been mapped into the address space, any loads and stores operate directly on the underlying uh, memory in the non-volatile memory module. Should notice that, however, the processor caches are still volatile. And so uh, software has to be aware that it's operating on this non-volatile memory. And if it wants the data to be uh, durable, it has to make sure that the uh, any cache data is written back uh, to ensure durability. And there are uh, instructions, some old and some new provided to make that possible. And your runtime system has to provide, um, execute those um, at the appropriate time. So what are the opportunities from a developer standpoint um, for automatic persistence? Um, there's this kind of uh, long cherished dream of simpler application code um, because now um, with this technology in memory and persistent representations are one and the same. You're operating on the same thing. And so um, if you keep data 
in non-volatile memory. Um, then you don't have to re write extra code to serialize and deserialize it out into block storage. Um, well, at least sometimes. Uh, sometimes you probably want to do that. For example, if you want to write a format that's portable, um, independent of language or implementation or OS or, or CPU architecture, or that it comes in a format that's uh, perhaps simpler and more robust or that compl complies with some kind of standard, then you still need to go through the serialization and deserialization. But if you don't have any of those requirements, then potentially you can just build your in-memory data structure and you're done. Uh, there's another advantage in that you're never leaving the type, say, type system of your language. And so um, you get an additional degree of type safety from going this route. Now, none of this is, is new. Um, various languages have provided capabilities for saving in-memory data structures, Lisp, Smalltalk, uh, and uh, there's a landmark paper from 1983 on PS Algol, which was the first programming language designed with this model explicitly in mind. And that spawned a whole bunch of work that followed in the 80s and especially in the 90s to build um, systems that, that adopted this model. So those are the advantages from the point of view of writing code. You have to potentially write a lot less of it. Um, there are also some uh, potential performance and other uh, advantages from the deployment standpoint. Um, if you don't have to read memory, uh, read data um, from block storage into memory when your application starts up, then potentially you have very much reduced startup times. And the reduced startup times gives you uh, much higher availability so that when you cycle your application, it's down for much less time uh, and unavailable um, than it would be if the data were stored in block storage. Um, another big potential advantage is that the uh, time required to make your data durable uh, is dropped by, you know, an order of magnitude or, or two or maybe even three, depending on what kind of storage medium you're comparing against. Uh, you can stabilize uh, updates very, very quickly. All you have to do is ensure that your the data that you've modified gets written back from cache into, into NVRAM. And finally, from a deployment standpoint, you can have much more RAM in your system and the RAM comes cheaper. And so you can afford to have more and that changes the economics of application building. That all sounds great, but of course it comes with some challenges. And uh, that first property that the in-memory and persistent representations are one and the same is a double-edged sword. Um, we now, when you operate in this style, you don't have a separate copy of the data in RAM that you read from disk. And so uh, how do you ensure consistency of that data? Every update updates the real durable data. So you need some way of batching updates and being able to undo them in the event of failure, provide some kind of atomicity. Uh, that implies some degree of logging and recovery and all of that it's all doable, but it eats into the performance gains that, that you were getting from the, from the non-volatile um, RAM. Another challenge is that you would like your data to be position independent. Um, when you map a file into memory, um, you can supply a specific address that you want it to, to, to map to, but in general, it's probably not a good idea to rely on that as a technique. Uh, for example, um, if you get two data sets that happen to want the same addresses, uh, you can't use them at the same time. Um, and in general, OSs don't like giving you the address that you asked for all the time. Um, you, you might think, for example, that on a 64-bit system, you have 64 bits of virtual address space, but actually the hardware usually re restricts some ranges and makes them unavailable. Uh, and these restrictions vary from system to system. And so a particular address might be mappable on one system, but isn't mappable on a different system. Um, another reason, so, so we, we want position independence. One way of, of achieving that is to relocate when we load a um, map a file into memory, but that comes with its own problems. 
uh, for example, if there is a failure during the mapping and relocation process, uh, you might have uh, a persistent memory region which is half relocated. Um, and so you now have to deal with, uh, in the runtime system, how to back out of that failure and get back to the previous system, which makes for a complicated world. Another issue is that um, you might potentially want to map in a very large data set. Um, for example, on the current systems, I think the maximum amount of NVRAM that's available is half a petabyte. Uh, relocating half a petabyte is going to take a little while. Um, and so um, you're going to incur a, a significant pause in startup, eating into that startup advantage if we're doing relocation. So my, my view um, is that it's better to have position independent data. And the key to position independent data is the pointers don't point to absolute addresses. They're self relative. So a pointer in, is in fact an offset. Uh, and the offset is from the address of the pointer. So a, po a pointer at address P that's pointing to a thing at V um, actually contains a, P, uh, a value that gives you P plus V. Um, luckily in our managed language runtime, uh, we can hide much of that from the user so they don't have to be aware of it in an unmanaged language then um, life is a little trickier. But I'm focusing on managed languages here because this is a VMs uh, workshop. So um, a final challenge is that uh, code changes uh, and it can't changes often. Um, I'm startled by some of those statistics that Stefan uh, gave out earlier as to the number of restarts in some of the uh, widely deployed cloud applications. Um, presumably some of those result in data structure changes. And if the data structure change occurs in the program, then we somehow have to, have to update the persistent data to, to mimic that. And that leads to a, a, an interesting uh, data evolution or schema evolution problem. Uh, there's been some work in this area, but it's, it's mostly um, terra incognita. Um, there hasn't been a lot of uh, practice in this area. And um, this is a good area for uh, anyone who's looking for a PhD topic, in my opinion. So as I said, this is not a new area. We've, we've had a number of uh, attempts at this in the past. And perhaps the most uh, uh, invested approach was uh, one that was pursued strongly in the 80s and the 90s. Um, based on the PS Algol work, which I, I designate the term persistence by reachability. And the idea here is similar to a garbage collector. We designate some object or value as being a persistent route. And, and then anything that's reachable from that route is uh, automatically persisted. And everything else, well, it can be volatile um, or it can be just garbage collected from persistent memory, but it doesn't, the, the two are equivalent from a, a user standpoint. This was the approach that was pursued by a variety of projects back then. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with was uh, a joint project between Sun Labs and uh, Glasgow University, and I think some other collaborators in the 90s. Uh, it was called Pyjama, which was kind of a play on Java. Um, it was resulted in a JSR, which ultimately did not succeed uh, and was not incorporated into the, the language. And um, we'll look at why that might be in a second. When we try and look, apply that work, which was of course not done in the context of non-volatile memory, but in, in the context of disk and, and uh, DRAM, when we try to apply that work to NVRAM, uh, one challenge is that um, we need to now move objects from DRAM to NVRAM when they become persistent, uh, which means as soon as they become reachable, but that, as to anyone who's familiar with garbage collection, doesn't present a huge problem. And uh, I'll point to the recent uh, papers and thesis by Thomas Schul at, uh, in, in Illinois um, for a good exemplar of how to do that for Java, uh, done in the work of the Maxine VM, in the context of the Maxine VM. However, there are still some problems, I think, with um, this approach. 
So one challenge is some objects are hard to deal with if you just automatically persist them. Uh, the most challenging by far is persisting threads um, with unmanaged frames. So frames from languages other than the managed language. Now, back, back in the days of Pyjama, this was in the, the height of the um, euphoria around pure Java. And the assumption there was that all programs would be pure Java. Now, 20 years later, we see that that's probably an unrealistic assumption. And so uh, many applications do have uh, external libraries which are not coded in Java, which have unmanaged frames, and you can't really deal with persisting those in any meaningful way other than by having, for example, a system VM, which just sort of hibernates the entire system. Um, another issue is what about objects that reference state that's external to that managed by the VM uh, and the sort of canonical examples here of, of files and sockets, which reference descriptors externally that have some kind of uh, external state when you when you bring that back into operation in, in a in a new process um, those things are not going to work automatically they have to have something applied to them to bring them back into 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 operation those are those problems are solvable i believe however the biggest uh, the biggest challenge in my opinion is uh, heap corruption so um, to illustrate, uh, some of you may recognize this gentleman who is one of the characters in a sitcom from some years ago set in an IT department. And he would um, answer all phone calls with problems and the, by asking the question, have you, have you tried turning it off and on again? Oh. In, in a more realistic accent, have you tried turning it off and on again? Um, and um, while that was funny, it's actually uh, funny in a kind of a painful way, which is that we, we as an industry have trained the entire population uh, of computer using humanity to restart applications and systems whenever there's a problem. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, I ask the rhetorical question, this being a Zoom call and not an in-person call, uh, how often uh, do you restart an application or system to resolve a problem? Uh, every day, every week? Um, I, I'd be surprised if there was anybody in this audience who did not regularly restart stuff on a at least daily or weekly basis to cure issues. And the question I pose, uh, which I'll let you think about for a moment, is, is why does that work? What does that mean? This is probably the single most useful piece of IT advice ever dispensed. And why does it work? Well, my answer to why it works is that the, the in-memory, i.e. volatile data, must be in some kind of a bad state. And I use bad in inverted commas. I'll explain that in a second while the persistent data out in block storage must be fine because when you restart it, the system comes back in a reasonable state, the problem is cleared. And so the problem must have been in the volatile state. Um, that's perhaps not surprising. In memory data structures, they change much more often as we saw earlier. Um, they're much more complicated than persistent data structures and they're much more vulner vulnerable to either bugs which can corrupt them, um, type related bugs, um, memory corruption bugs, and also hardware errors such as bit flips are much more likely to affect um, DRAM than they are um, non-volatile storage. Uh, I use the inverted commas here because bad doesn't necessarily mean incorrect. For example, um, a system that's suffering from a memory leak can eventually reach a state where the performance is so bad that you can't put up with it anymore and you restart it, but it's not incorrect in the kind of formal sense of the word or everything is still in the state the programmer intended. Uh, it's just perhaps not the state that the user wants. So what does that mean for a persistent heap? Before I get into that, 
I want to introduce some new te terminology and I don't do this gratuitously. I've spent a little bit of time trying to find existing terms that that capture these notions. And there is there is actually some existing terminology from uh, networking, but it's it's kind of confusing in this context. So I'm introducing some new terminology. I'm going to describe data as being either base data or derived data and base data are data which can only be recovered from a copy in a different failure domain or if you don't have a copy in a different failure domain and you lose your copy it's gone um, derived data however can be recovered by computation from less derived or ultimately base data uh, as an example of this to a to a bunch of programmers um, imagine you're typing at the keyboard of a, an ide that's then um, parsing and compiling your application, your, your keystrokes are base data um, until they've been saved in a different failure domain, um, they can't be recovered. Um, the, de, the data that are derived from that, such as bytecodes, IR, machine code, uh, can be recompiled, can be regenerated from the keystrokes. And so those are derived data. Now, going back to our heap corruption issue, um, I think one of the problems that crippled persistent programming languages is that restarts wouldn't resolve problems in persistent heaps. And persistent heaps, because they mixed all of the base and derived data in the same heap, were vulnerable to all the bugs that we have suffered for many decades now, and we don't seem to be able to uh, eliminate. So. Um, Discarding and recovering um, heaps that are corrupt and contain base data are, uh, could be expensive or even impossible um, in a persistent context. Uh, you can't really dive into a heap um, and disentangle it and pull out the bits that you want in a practical way. Maybe there's an opportunity there for someone to figure out how to do that, but right now that's a that's an unsolved problem. So I think that's a, a serious weakness in the persistence by reachability model. And um, that is what's motivated um, the model that I've been pursuing, which is uh, one of multiple heaps. So the idea in a multiple heap world is that we partition the data, uh, every object in our what used to be previous heap now resides in one of several heaps and the heaps have different properties. Uh, one of the heaps resides in volatile memory and is discarded at program termination, just like we've always been familiar with. So we can put a whole bunch of stuff in there that doesn't need to live beyond the execution of the program, knowing that it will disappear when the program exits. Now, in the simplest scenario, we could have a persistent heap and put all everything else in there, but that suffers from the same potential corruption problem that it mixes a base and derived data. So I think a more robust approach is to partition our uh, persistent data so that base data live in, in a dedicated heap or heaps, derived data that we want to persist live elsewhere, and volatile data live in the volatile heap. And then in the event of a corruption, um, we can, the volatile data will be discarded for sure. And if we end up in a bad state, we can discard the heaps containing derived data, um, leaving the base data intact. Uh, and if our problem still exists, then we, then we have a serious issue. So uh, base data structures should be constructed then to maximize reliability uh, and isolated from the rest of the world in, in separate heap or heaps and um, the runtime could supply more extensive protection recovery for those heaps containing base data. So I've talked in general terms so far. Um, now I'm going to go into some specifics of how this might be embodied in Java, which has been the vehicle I've been um, pursuing this work in. And then I'll go into the uh, experimental implementation. Uh, in fact, I'll mix those two together because it's pretty hard to disentangle them at this point, um, having only one artifact. 
So um, in this uh, system, I have every heap represented by an object, which acts as a descriptor uh, that kind of names the heap. And that's an instance of a subclass of heap. And um, that provides uh, a way of interacting with heaps. When the JVM starts, it starts with a single volatile heap, just as we're used to. But now that heap is represented as an object, which is accessible to um, application code. The object uh, I've chosen to call uh, heap.main. So it's a, a variable, a final variable of heap. And it's an instance or the instance of volatile heap. Once that's running, um, you, it, we have basically a standard Java execution, nothing different as from before, but now a program can uh, create instances of persistent heap in one of two ways. We can either um, attach existing heaps that have been saved before, or we can create a new empty heap. Um, persistent heaps have a single root field and the type of the root field is specified by a type parameter uh, of the generic type persistent heap. So for example, a persistent heap containing a table mapping strings to integers would have a type declaration uh, such as that. Uh, on the slide here, and um, uh, here's an example line of code, no big surprise there, hopefully, as to how that looks. So how does the multiple heap model work? Uh, I'm going to run through an animation now. Um, some of you may know I'm, I'm a big fan of animations, and if there's one part of this presentation I want you to understand, it's, it's this animation sequence, which I think captures the essence of what's going on. So let's imagine a world in which we're about to run a program. Uh, we have a persistent heap off, onto the, off to the right, which was created by some previous program. Um, it contains some objects, the gray box, the green boxes, uh, which are connected by references. And it's kind of in a faded state because it's out in uh, storage, but it hasn't been attached to a running instance. So then we start up a program. Uh, that program gets a main heap, which is volatile. And in that volatile heap, we can start creating objects and making um, connections between them. All of these objects are, of course, uh, discarded uh, when the program exits, which I'm representing by this kind of gradual fill on the green boxes and the dotted lines on the arcs. Eventually, this point, this program can attach that persistent heap uh, by invoking a particular operation in persistent heap. Um, that heap then becomes live and accessible within the address space of the program, and the objects within it can be manipulated. And in particular, we can make a change. So I've added a new uh, pointer. Um, in the persistent heap and notice that that pointer is a dotted line because uh, we haven't actually done a commit yet to checkpoint this. So if we were to fail at this point, the persistent heap would revert to its state as it was at the pro when the program began. So now uh, we can create another heap. This is making a new empty heap and putting some objects in it. Again, all of these things are uh, volatile or rather discarded when in the event of program failure. And then eventually we can invoke a checkpoint and a checkpoint stabilizes the state of a persistent heap all in one go. So our dotted line becomes a solid line. If we checkpoint the uh, second heap, then all of those objects become solid objects with solid lines connecting them. And after that, our program can terminate, our heaps become inactive, and uh, they're out in stable storage. So I'll take a little pause there. If anybody is not clear about anything in there, please ask a question now. Uh, and then I will go into all of the um, issues. 
So here is a, a pseudocode sketch of a, a minimal example. It's pseudocode because I've, uh, I've deliberately made some errors here, which I'm gonna explain in a second. And also I've omitted all of the error handling stuff, which inevitably clutters real programs. Um, but in this program, I have a, a variable of type uh, persistent heap of integer. So this is a this is kind of the hello world of persistence. It's an, a heap that contains one integer. Um, if the file containing th that heap doesn't currently exist, I create a heap and stick an integer in it. Otherwise, I attach an existing heap and I increment the integer that was in that heap. And then at the end, I checkpoint and exit. And so this is uh, kind of the world's most expensive counter. Um, however, there is an issue here, which is that um, persistent heaps need to be self-contained. You can't have references from, for example, um, a persistent heap to a volatile object because when the program exits, uh, the volatile object is going to go away and um, it's going to be a dangling reference. So by default, um, heaps cannot reference objects outside themselves. That is persistent heaps. The volatile heap can, re rep uh, can refer to any object, but persistent heaps have to be self-contained by default. And so I had a right barrier to the Java, Java virtual machine to prevent such uh, references from being created. And that throws an error when an invalid reference, uh, um, an attempt is made to create an invalid reference. So in that previous picture, um, if we were to attempt to create the, the arrows with the, the prohibit symbols on them, uh, the VM would throw an error. So that code, in fact, is not quite correct because we're making a new integer, but the new integer by default would be in the volatile heap and it would be referenced from a persistent heap and we have to ensure that the integer is actually allocated inside the persistent heap. And so uh, to address that, I add the notion of a current thread local allocation heap. Uh, this is, in, you might think of as an extra register in the virtual machine. And um, that's used uh, when objects are created with new. So new references this, this uh, heap and makes an object in that heap. And we can, uh, we can wrap any piece of code with the uh, operation heap.run, which causes that code to run with the default allocation heap being the, uh, the heap in, that's the receiver of the run method. Um, and so the correct code now for the allocation is that we have to do this uh, wrapping of the assignment because we have uh, allocation inside. And this, this obviously can invoke other methods and uh, all of the allocations that take place from within that code or anything that it executes take place within that. Um, the run method can be nested so we can have a stack of uh, such thread local allocation heaps, et cetera. It, it, sh it should be fairly straightforward, I think, to understand. And so our pseudocode, still with the exception handling omitted, now looks like this. So we have to sprinkle in a little bit of extra code um, to um, wrap allocations or code that ultimately results in allocations. Now, there are still some additional restrictions and consequences that I should go into. Um, threads must uh, still reside in volatile memory. Um, for the same reasons I mentioned earlier, we can't persist threads which contain frames from forward code. And a consequence of that is that uh, all object locks belong to threads. And when the program is discarded, the locks all disappear. So when you attach a persistent heap, nothing is in a locked state because the locks were all volatile. Um, in general, I add an annotation um, at main all uppercase, which allows uh, classes to force allocation to be in uh, heap.main. So Java lang thread in my modified JDK is annotated in such a way. And so all threads are allocated in, uh, in, vol in the volatile heap. Um, similarly, class objects in my implementation are allocated in the volatile heap and by implication, static variables along with them and uh, when you attach 
uh, a persistent heap, there's a linking phase that takes place, which uh, finds the corresponding class in your program and matches it up with the objects in the heap. And uh, at least in this implementation, classes of objects in a persistent heap must be identically the same as those in the application. I don't have any evolution mechanism yet. That's going to come later. Um, now, I said that by default, um, you can't have references from a persistent heap to any other kind of heap. Um, there is a way of bypassing that with um, extra code. And in particular, if you annotate a variable as at into heap, uh, then in a persistent heap, that allows um, that variable to contain an into heap reference. And the, uh, the barrier check is then uh, not used. But such references are nulled out when the heap is attached. So there's no danger of a dangling pointer. Um, so the question is then, how is that useful? Well, I provide a, a, a new interface, which I call reconnectable, which allows an object to register with its enclosing heap so that uh, when the heap is attached, its reconnect method is invoked, and that can be used to reinitialize any interheap references. So from there, hopefully, you can figure out which volatile object you want and uh, connect it or throw an error or whatever, depending on the context. Uh, that interface then is implemented by a new class called heap proxy, which uh, basically provides a wrapped single variable of a given type. Uh, and that allows uh, gets and puts to set that variable um, and reconnect to reinitialize the variable. And from this, you can build uh, much more elaborate data linking mechanisms so that uh, a web of interconnections is reestablished when a heap is attached. Um, so far, I have only these simple ones, but I've sketched more, uh, but I won't go into those in the interests of time. I mentioned that statics existed as part of classes and the classes are volatile in this model. Um, and so there is some uh, rewriting of code necessary to, uh, to, you, to, to deal with existing code that uh, makes assumptions that now uh, cannot be maintained. So for example, if a static holds onto an object, then um, and that object is in Volat the volatile heap, then it can't be referenced from um, a persistent heap unless you use the interheap mechanism. So you, you have to make some choices in this kind of situation. You can either uh, not use that pattern anymore. Um, so for an example of that is um, in my JDK, Java Lang integer, uh, just like in the real JDK, contains a cache of popular integers. Uh, well, those integers exist in volatile memory, so they can't be referenced from persistent heaps. So this cache is only actually used when I allocate integers in main. Otherwise, it, it's not used. Uh, an alternative is to generate some reconnection. And uh, one of the scenarios in which that's necessary in my system is that uh, enums need to be uh, wrapped because an enum contains a static array of its uh, the objects that represent the enum values. And those are uh, volatile, and so they can't be referenced from a persistent heap. So instead, I have an enum proxy, which wraps an enum and does the indirection to get at the underlying enum value and hangs on to the ordinal value so that when it's reconnected, it figures out the new volatile object that it should be referring to. And that could all be done mechanically, but in my, in my system currently, uh, you have to rewrite that code and wrap your enums. Another uh, pattern that needs to be addressed is if you need a heap local copy of some object. So for example, um, in a concurrent skip list map, there's a sentinel object called base header, which is used to terminate these, uh, the, the leaves of these skip list maps. And that's a volatile object. Um, so it can't live in the, the heap that might contain the skip list map. And so there's a, a class I introduced called heap local, which is a uh, if you're familiar with thread local, looks very similar. And that basically means a maintains a table of such objects, one per heap, uh, indexed by the heap local instance. And so there's a little bit of code rewriting required in the concurrent skip list map 
to deal with uh, this particular pattern. So uh, in this model, what do you have to go through to make an application persistent if you have an existing one or to reuse existing classes? Uh, obviously, you need to have some place in your main program uh, that uh, creates or attaches uh, the persistent heap. The standard model is if has isn't already there, it's created. And if it is already there, it's attached. Um, you have to identify which data structures are going to live in which heap and uh, wrap the allocation code or the code that calls the allocation code or wherever up the stack to uh, ensure that those uh, allocations take place in the right heap. Uh, you have to find the statics which reference objects which are going to be persisted and make the changes just as I described, deal with enums and such. And um, sprinkle heap.run heap through your code um, to ensure that the allocations happen in the correct heap. Um, finally, um, you have to find points in which your heap reaches a consistent state and uh, invoke the checkpoint operation to stabilize the heap and make sure it's uh, available in durable memory in a consistent state. Um, in the event of a failure, it, the system will recover to the last consistent state that you checkpointed. So in principle, all of this has to be done in the entire JDK, uh, which is no small task. I've been uh, doing this on a as needed basis as I port code and try things out. Uh, I haven't found anything super challenging yet, um, but I've only done a tiny fraction of the system and there is uh, a long way to go. And there are many applications and lots of lines of Java code in the world. So part of the purpose of this talk is to get you all thinking about what this would mean for you and whether it would present serious problems. So I've, I motivated this talk originally as um, keeps being resident in non-volatile RAM, but if, if you've been uh, listening carefully, you'll have realized actually I'm not relying on any of the properties of non-volatile RAM at all in this implementation. There's no reason why an implementation couldn't just read a saved heap from disk into volatile RAM and a checkpoint write it back out again. Uh, obviously, that's slower than using non-volatile RAM, but the good thing is everyone has DRAM, uh, relatively few have systems with NVRAM, and uh, we're in an early phase here, and so experimentation, uh, wide experimentation is much more important than uh, highly performant implementation. Um, that could, of course, be optimized somewhat by writing out just modified parts, and I have a a plan for how to get to that in the future version. And um, I point out that this would be uh, potentially useful for, say, starting uh, app unprovisioned applications quickly in a cloud. Uh, and I'll be talking a lot more about this particular topic at the conversation starter on Thursday. Uh, so this, this provides a way of fast startup of applications. Graal native, VM native image, which is the context of, for all the work I've been doing, allows fast code startup. This would allow for uh, fast loading of uh, pre-saved uh, pre data. So let me go on a little bit now onto the prototype that I'm working on. As I said, it's based on Graal VM native image. Um, the first version is kind of just a simple uh, proof of concept without getting into really fancy implementation techniques. So in this version, in fact, I don't need non-volatile memory, all operates in DRAM. Uh, it just reads heaps into DRAM. It does relocation, which as I said, has problems in a long-term scaling issue, um, but for an experimental prototype seems to be fine, I think. Um, and it does the linking of objects from uh, the heap to the classes that reside in Graal VM's uh, image heap. And uh, I've spent a little bit of effort in making the into heap barrier relatively cheap so that performance is not truly dreadful. Um, it's well along, it should be ready for experimental use uh, sometime later this year and I'll be looking for experimenters to, to play with it and ev evaluate the usability and the utility of this, this particular model. Um, the, one of the things I want to stress here is 
So far, this looks like a viable approach. Uh, however, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and I'm not the consumer here. Uh, the important things for others to evaluate the model. That's why the title of the talk is a question uh, because I don't know the answer, whether the many heaps really are better than one, but this is uh, one way to go at it. And I think uh, with enough evaluation, we'll come to a definitive answer to that question. So uh, that's the um, description of the current prototype. Future versions, if it's deemed worth the effort, could refine the model and the API, improve all of the things that need improving, like performance and scaling, support NVRAM. Uh, a big item of work is to try figure out how to allow for class evolution and um, potentially make persistence available to other GraalVM languages um, because we do support a variety. So at this point, I should uh, switch to a terminal. So I'm going to stop sharing that and uh, hope you can all see the terminal. So the, um, at the top of the screen here, I've got the, uh, the counter example, uh, i.e. example of a counter, not a counter example, um, with all of the failure code. So it's kind of messy because of that. Um, and I've uh, used uh, GraalVM's native image to build a binary version of that um, in the bottom. It takes a few minutes, so I didn't want to do that live. And now I can run it. Um, when I run that the first time, it creates a heap, uh, which ends in JAH for Java heap. Uh, and saves it. It's currently doing a chunk heap representation. I'm writing the whole chunk out. So it's a whole megabyte, even though there's only probably a kilobytes worth of actual data in there. Uh, in addition to the integer, there's a bunch of um, bookkeeping objects that are required. If I run it again, it will see that the counter is already there and do an increment and checkpoint and so on and so forth. And um, if I run it a bunch of times, you'll see that we can attach and checkpoint reasonably quickly. It, it's doing about 50 a second, I guess, 20 milliseconds per invocation, which isn't a whole lot slower than, than a, gra a native image startup. So I'm going to stop that and switch back to the slides. OK, so uh, at this point, I'm kind of ready to conclude. Um, I've given you an overview of a new model of persistence based on multiple heaps and a Java API. And the reason why I think this is a superior way of going. However, that really is going to be determined over the coming years as people play with it and try it out. Uh, I'm currently working on a prototype that allows for experimentation and evaluation. I'm hoping to release that later this year. And at this point, I will take uh, questions, comments, and uh, any other th remarks that people might have.